Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a great a pleasure for me to be here and to be part of this really excellent forum. And uh, uh, I'm uh, I share with the other speakers that uh, my subject is different from the others in a rather big way. I'm, uh, I'm using this title, Monetary Unions, Free Trade Areas in the World Economy, just to emphasize the fact that these two issues are connected together. And, and all, there's a great a discussion about free trade areas. Countries all over the world are making them. It's really a big growth industry in the world, and I fully support them. But I think it does have a, a relationship with monetary unions. Um, I was... Um, Maybe this is a little bit of an anecdote, but I was in Shanghai in 2001 at the time of the uh, uh, APEC forum and uh, at the Shangri-La Hotel. And I had a, a, a speech that uh, followed, um, just followed um, George Bush's speech. Uh, but um, it, it was a huge, huge room, and of course uh, the aisles were all filled when he spoke, and they weren't when I was there, but I had a very large audience anyway. And uh, I was talking about monetary unions in a way, not, or not free trade areas, or monetary aspects, monetary cooperation for the APEC, because at that time the APEC um, uh, plan was to have a kind of free trade area in APEC, a very large uh, area, and uh, I thought that I always thought that uh, if you have um, flexible exchange rates for each country in those countries with movements up and down, it, it vitiates a lot of the major issues of uh, of the uh, uh, free trade area. Uh, but, um, I um, I think I'm pressing. Uh, do I? Do I press it here, or, or no? This. Uh, um, oh, uh, oh um, how do I? How do I move it forward? Okay, okay. I can do this myself. I think. Can I? I one of these buttons. Uh, let's be. Uh, Anyway, let's see. Uh, I put this, uh, these are different types of, not uh, monetary unions in a way. Uh, some of them are anyway, the different phases over the last two centuries. And we always have to look a little bit at, uh, at history in order to uh, try to see how we're, where we are now and how we're moving in the future because there's usually a lot of lead time as the international monetary system changes. They had bimetallism when a couple of countries like France and the United States fixed the price of both gold and silver. But then the Civil War came and the U.S. left it and Franco-Prussian War came and they left it. And so then countries moved to gold standard or, or silver standards. But the sil gold standard was the rising one and there was a big movement toward the gold standard. So most countries except um, advanced countries except uh, China uh, were on the gold standard at the time of the outbreak of World War One, But uh, that had a big effect uh, uh, at that time because it, just a year before World War I started, the Federal Reserve System came into existence, a central bank for the country that had become now not just the biggest economy in the world, but bigger than the next three biggest economies put together. And when uh, that country formed a, had a central bank, it gave it, in fact, subsequent the power to determine the international monetary system or at least to veto any other kind of system that other countries may want to have. And it took over from the pound sterling as the major um, uh, major economy in the world. This is another look at these things. I don't want to go into this uh, historical part, but just just quickly, uh, the um, uh, when the, the pound sterling de facto became inconvertible in World War I, the dollar became the uh, main world unit of account. And after the war, uh, the dollar assumed a certain particular role uh, and uh, 
uh, and more important role in the in the pound sterling. Then Europe went back to the world gold standard, and uh, and, they, and the Europe and the world followed, and that. As it always happens, whenever countries go back to a gold standard, it creates a deflation. It did after Napoleonic Wars, it did in every every period in history, and this was a, like this created the deflation that led to the Great Depression. And the U.S., Britain, and then the U.S. went off gold, and a year later, in 1934, the U.S. raised the price from 20 something to 35 dollars, and um, that became the basic framework or, or source price, the most important price in the world from 1934 until 1971. And when the 1944 came, the Bretton Woods uh, meeting in 1944 uh, that set up the rules of the gold standard, they devised a set of rules that were subsequently modified and it turned into a, a, a dollar standard anchored to gold because gold, the U.S. dollar was convertible into gold for foreign monetary authorities. But it wasn't a real gold standard and it, because it didn't keep the world price level in line with the fixed price of gold. So when wartime inflations, the Korean War and subsequent places um, eventually led, made gold undervalued, um, Europe, the uh, U.S. had to sell about two-thirds of its stock to uh, gold. In 1948, the United States had 70% of the world's monetary gold. In, in 1971, uh, they had only 25%. So most of that went to uh, to Europe, and uh, now uh, we're um, uh, then then uh, in 1971, the U.S. for reasons that were quite clear, took the dollar off gold. They didn't want to sell any more gold. They they wanted to keep at least part of that there, and the world broke up into flexible exchange rates. But but the flexible exchange rate movement wasn't in any way prepared. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a good system. Nobody had never in the history of economics any treatises written saying that uh, this was a good arrangement for every country to have flexible exchange rates. And yet that's what got stuck in the system uh, with the second amendment to the. IMF uh, and that uh, it, it to, to manage flexible exchange rates and that's the international monetary system we have now so it was the opposite of a, of a, of a gold um, uh, no, no, this yeah it was opposite of this now uh, this these are just uh, discussions of that um, the age of the pound sterling and how it transformed into the age of the dollar this is like the uh, a picture of it these circles or globes represent monetary powers, more or less, uh, more or less proportioned to GDP of the area. In 19, 1890, Britain was the center of the monetary power, and uh, uh, but the biggest economy is already the United States at that time, and you, this is the way the gold standard was all major countries. Currencies were convertible into gold. As I say, up, up in the left corner, you see China there, China is, um, and Mexico without uh, uh, without being part of that system on the silver standard. Then, uh, just on the eve of the war, uh, Britain, London was still the center of the world capital market. When war broke out, capital rushed to London. The pound appreciated, but for only a few months, quickly then, people realized that Britain, the pound, was no longer the safe haven. And after a few months then, the dollar became the uh, currency and that was uh, waiting in the wings, so to speak. And of course, with the newly created central bank, the Federal Reserve could could change that. Well, the World War changed it. The ascending power. When I when I think of the shift in currency systems, I make a solar analogy. It's like our solar system. Uh, gold is the center of it. The sun is this gold is the sun, same color as uh, as gold. And the big big center of gravity there. But if one of the planets become bigger and bigger than the sun, eventually the planets and the sun itself will rotate around 
around that planet. If Jupiter, let's say, becomes the biggest uh, planet and bigger than the sun itself, then all it'll be the center of the system. That's more or less what happened with the United States because, uh, especially after the Second World War, the United States had a super dominant economy in the world. So, but the restoration of gold was a mistake because the people who did that hadn't studied history. They should have known that every time when countries go back to, just as when countries go off gold or silver, they have inflation. When they go back onto it, they have a new kind of deflation. So uh, in the 1920s, this is the way it is. The United States was de facto, even though it hadn't set up the gold standard, it was, was the de facto center of it, and meetings would take place in Washington. But the return to the gold standard caused deflation. It had the biggest risk of American tariffs and smooth all the tariffs. It was the deflation that created the then, de facto, I think the right devaluation of the dollar in 1934 created the dollar cent. It became the dollar cent, but the dollar standard that until 1971 was anchored to gold with convertibility, not for the American people. The American people, after 1933, were forbidden to hold gold. They, they would get sued if they by the U.S. Treasury, if they, if they held gold or started to hold gold, they had to turn it in. And uh, but the rest of the world could be on gold, but the United States was not. So the system then was the U.S. fixed the price of gold, and this price lasted until 1971. Other countries fixed their currencies to the gold convertible dollar. Then the 1930s brought war clouds again from Germany. World War broke out. In 1941, President Roosevelt asked his Treasury Secretary to begin preparing for a post-war monetary order and a world currency. And then there were British and American and Canadian plans proposed for discussion, and that led to the famous Bretton Woods meeting in, in July 1944. Now, that's coming up the 70th anniversary of Bretton Woods uh, in 19, 1944. They tried to devise a monetary system. They sort of stumbled in a lot of different ways, but they got enough of it right so that it was a system that could last at least until 19, uh, 1971. And uh, they, no world currency, no world currency existed. Roosevelt had suggested plan up for a world currency, but they uh, didn't do it because probably 1944 was the presidential election year, and it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't have been good politics. So it never it was dropped. Over to the British the British plan didn't come into being. The American plan, the world currency in it, uh, was dropped out of it. So that was the uh, now the twins. Uh, we have here Robert Zellick, as I think it's the 11th president of the World Bank, one of the two world twins that was created in 1944, that little place in Mount Hampshire at the Mount Washington Hotel. And they, uh, they set up then the, 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 or endorsed the global uh, monetary system that turned into, it wasn't quite the design, it turned into a dollar standard anchored to gold. And at the end of that conference, I wanted to make this point. It, it was um, Secretary Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, in his concluding speech, closing the conference, he said, this was the end of monetary nationalism. But that system broke down in three stages. Gold was, first of all, overvalued by the raise in the price. Then it was equal, equally valued, appropriately valued. Then it was undervalued, and there was no mechanism to stop it. But uh, what I do want, want to say is that when we come to, came to flexible exchange rates, it undid that it violated that speech that Morgenthau had said, this is the end of monetary nationalism, because floating exchange rates was a way of getting back to monetary nationalism. Each country, its own currency, each country, its own inflation rate. 
So the flaws in the system, it, uh, I won't, won't go into that de in detail. Uh, then there was a, a short period where we went back to a, a, a fixed rate with the dollar, 1971, until uh, until uh, uh, until it broke up because uh, the uh, in the U.S. it was a pure dollar standard, no longer convertible into gold. So the U.S. was effectively determining the monetary policy of the world, and Europe didn't like it. Europe thought it was too inflationary, and then uh, the George Shultz, the Secretary of Treasury in the United States, discard the saying, future President of France, but then Minister of Finance in France, and Helmut Schmidt, the Chancellor of the Checker, and, and Chancellor of, uh, of um, the, the Minister of Finance in Germany, and subsequently Chancellor of Germany, these three important people got together in June and decided that we'll break up the international monetary system, scrap it, and let countries solve the inflation problem on their own. Uh, George Schultz, a good friend of mine, was a, a disciple of Milton Friedman, unfortunately, and Milton didn't really have a good sense of, uh, of monetary uh, affairs. Anyway, the system broke down because, because it was, uh, well, too inflationary for Europe, but it was what American policy wanted to have for itself. And uh, that was the end of that, uh, of that episode. So we moved to flexible exchange rates. And now the, now the world looks uh, different. It's not connected together. You've got the globes floating other in space. They're no longer cir circulating around the dollar. Uh, but on, beneath it all, the, the, uh, uh, just think, the, right now there are 188 members of the International Monetary Fund. Not quite 188 currencies, because Europe, 17 of those countries use the same currency, the euro. Uh, but just imagine what the world would be like if you had, in fact, um, uh, 170 or so separate currencies, separate countries, all with floating exchange rates, and no way, there would be no coherence in the system. What made, made flexible exchange rates possible was that it never really came into being because the dollar served a role still because of its size as the unit of account of the system. So all exchange rates could be related to the dollar. If you had 200 currencies, if you had 200 currencies in the country, you'd find out that you would have 19,700 exchange rates, counting the cross exchange rates. Uh, and uh, the, the, that would be the the number. But you, you get down to it when you've got a numerator, you, when you can find a numerator, you get it down to 200 or, nine, or 199 exchange rates, all based on that one. So there is coherence in it, but the rise of the European bloc in the 1970s, the creation of the European monetary system, System. And then the leading up the creation of the euro itself began to split that American unit of account hegemony and block and began to undermine the dollar as a global monetary system. It split it in half. So uh, it didn't uh, work. So now here's the point I want to make is that uh, under the uh, uh, gold standard, there were no systemic crises. There were problems with the gold standard, maybe too much supply of gold or too little, or going on or going off gold, but no basic uh, problems with the system itself. Under the Bretton Woods system, there were national crises under it, but there's no systemic crisis on it. But after the system broke up in 1971, the dollar put off gold, you had floating exchange rates, then you had a whole series of different crises. I'll just put down the uh, ones, of course, you remember immediately of the oil crisis. The story, suddenly, once, once the dollar was taken off gold, just within a month of the Smithsonian, the meeting of the Smithsonian Institution, December 1971, the price of gold, when they were refixing exchange rates, they still used gold in it, even though nobody was buying and selling it, but they raised the price from 35 to $38 an ounce within a month. 
OPEC had its meeting at that time, this is before the big OPEC, and raised the price of oil to the same extent. Already you had in motion what was going to happen. 1974 um, with that, and 1979, those oil crises. And over that period you had the sinking dollar in the late 70s and then a soaring dollar in the early 80s, and that caused the savings and loan crisis. And it caused the international debt crisis. Developing countries would borrow at the cheap dollars and they were being pushed into borrowing and governments always love to borrow if they can borrow <laughs> what they think is cheaply. And then they had to pay back in, in the expensive dollars later and that was, Mexico was the one that first created the, that crisis. Then the, so the exchange rates were, instability was involved in that issue. Then the IMF Asian crisis, is it, is it sometimes called? I, I heard the term IMF Asian crisis, first of all, in, in Korea, which, where it was being called that. Maybe it's unfair or not to the, to the IMF. But the, the, what crony capitalism and all these things were talked about as the cause of that crisis, it wasn't at all. The cri cause of the crisis was China had devalued um, the, it, its uh, currency. It raised the dollar from... Uh, in 1994 from 5.5 RMB to 8.7 RMB and then it was letting the dollar go down until it got to in about 8.28 8 where, it was, where it was fixed for a while but the important point that was the shocking point was that the uh, after the Mexican crisis, the dollar had gone down and the yen had gone up to was 90 was uh, less than 80 yen, about 78 yen, in April 1995. And in the next three years, the dollar soared and the and to against the yen to 148 yen, and it was that huge depreciation of the yen against the dollar that. Put, rocked all those countries that were on the holding on to the dollar into the into the crisis. That was the cause of the Asian crisis. It's the instability of major exchange rates. The IMF could never say this. They must have somebody at the IMF must have realized this, but they couldn't say it because the system was an I, was a, was promoted by the IMF of flexible exchange rates and that. And then the next one was the Lehman shock and the world crisis. Now, uh, it's strange that uh, what caused the great crisis? Well, of course, we have the subprime mortgage uh, thing that went on. And uh, in 2007, uh, you had the uh, meeting August 7th and 8th of the central banks and the I uh, World Central Bank, the, the European Central Bank pushed out 95 billion dollars of new money in uh, in in one one day the big record now it doesn't seem so much with the numbers we get today but this is a lot then and then other central banks added uh, all together about in those two days 300 billion dollars to get solve the liquidity immediate li balance sheet problem of, of the major banks with that uh, with that crisis but that wasn't that wasn't the big financial crisis that came about the, the big financial crisis came with the soaring, uh, soaring of the uh, uh, of the dollar, uh, and the dollar went up by 30 percent in the summer of 2008. The uh, uh, I, the um, um, the euro was a uh, dollar 64 in June 08, and in October it had fallen to a dollar 23. That's why Europe for a while escaped the crisis, but the United States had it, and it shocked the and, and undermined the housing, everything else. Now, here's what I I know my time is short, so I'm going to make this quick. Uh, what happened here is that the the creation of the euro now aggravated the importance of swinging exchange rates because it created before the dollar still could represent the mainstream of the world. Now there's two big blocks out there, two big blocks. Before the euro, this is the way it looked. Creation of the euro, it concentrated the monetary power of Europe. After the euro, you have a big block out there. Not quite as big yet as the United States, but as the, as the dollar, but at different exchange rates, it could be higher. When the euro gets higher, it gets bigger in terms of the way we measure this. So uh, this created a major problem. Europe's got 
important strengths in the Euro was a great thing. I was a big proponent of the Euro, of course, and I made the first plan for it in 1969. But the, uh, uh, and the Europe's got a lot of gold, but Europe's weaknesses now, you see lack of fiscal discipline, enacted welfare state reforms they couldn't afford, and the debt GDP ratios that had, were over 100% before they entered the Euro when the Maastricht condition was 60% only. So, but Europe gave monetary stability, but not fiscal stability. But now, the important thing is that what is it's under the system. The six problems of the system, I'm just made, uh, are all, and these problems, by the way, in, in 2011, uh, France became the chairman of the G20, and he enunciated um, what I call the Sarkozy critique of the system uh, as, as the chairman of the G20. Um, he said, excessive instability of raw material prices, excessive instability of exchange rates, and lack of governance in the system. Now, the instability of raw material prices came in that period I'm talking about, and exchange rates uh, in, in 2008, when, you remember when the price of oil went up to $148, and then in two or three months, it came down to $33? A, a shocking instability. Never, never before have we seen anything like that. So the euro split the mainstream in the world in, in, in half like that, and uh, and that now creates a problem for the system. Here it is. See what I showed you this, the way it looks now. The power can change. The consequence though is the dollar is less useful. It's not an anchor for currency. Whenever China fixes its currency to the dollar, and China does de facto. Uh, China thinks it's fixing, but it's not fixing to the world economy yet. Now, because whenever the dollar euro goes up, China can have a crisis. What happened when the dollar went up against the euro? Uh, it, it, China had been appreciating slowly, the dollar is falling, uh, but they, they stopped appreciating against the appreciating dollar in, in the summer of 2008. They fixed it at 6.8, 6 and, uh, and that was fixed for, for a couple of years of that because they couldn't appreciate against the soaring dollar. But, but fixing to the dollar no longer gives the country stability. So this is the system now as China grows, it will become bigger, and at one point it will overtake the dollar as the, in terms of the GDP power. It won't have the financial depth yet. We need all what uh, Robert Zellick and others are saying, the need for reform, financial reform. That has to be the big next thing for China, but uh, this would be the short. But he, what we need to move toward and think about for the 70th anniversary of the IMF is to see whether what would be the route to uh, to restoration of a, a, a reformation of a system? And I might add that I read a, 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 a very nice article by uh, Robert Zellick on a, a kind of call for a return to some kind of Bretton Woods uh, system, kind of stability. I won't go into that, but that's definitely along the lines that uh, I think we have to have. You, what I'm suggesting is that to correct the defect of the system, it's the swings between the dollar euro rate, which are so big, rate, they, together they represent 40% of the world economy. If you could fix what, that one exchange rate, the dollar euro rate, manage that rate, more or less in the way, oddly enough, uh, uh, John Williams was arguing about in, as an alternative to the Bretton Woods system. He was arguing for the pound and, and sterling and the dollar to be fixed, a kind of key currency. But the euro and the dollar are now the the key currencies and stabilize the exchange rate of that, and that means, of course, you have to do something about coordinating monetary policies. I won't go in, you can't fix it the way it was fixed under Bretton Woods, where all the other countries fix both the bottom and top, and, and, and top limits of their currencies. Now you have, e have a sharing of the fixing and coordination of policies that result from that. So, uh, the, uh, without uh, going into those details, and I think, by the way, just uh, an instance when QE3 came into being last October, uh, the, the euro was a dollar twenty-one, and uh, Europe would have participated in that the benefit from that QE3 uh, 
if um, uh, if um, they hadn't let the euro soar, the euro soared to a dollar thirty-seven. If they'd stabilized it, then Europe wouldn't have had its secondary recession. So it's again we get into the problem. If you stabilize the exchange rate, you have a new block there that represents the mainstream of the world economy, something like the dollar was. Now, what else should we do? Well, uh, policies, of course, would be needed, but uh, there'd be several advantages. Now, this is this is China. We have to mention China. Let me be, be conclude with this discussion. This is China's exchange rate, the, the price of the dollar from 1978 on. I guess the chart doesn't come through there, but up until 1994. Then, then the, the de devaluations, that big movement up in, on, on uh, January 1, 1994, when the, uh, uh, the uh, dollar went to 8.7. 8 it came down fixed until 2005 uh, in the spring uh, at um, at um, at uh, at 8.28, and then the then there was a quick adjustment down, and so so it was allowed to get back. Now now it's getting close to six again. That's the history. So China keeps its currency related to the dollar. So uh, once China and, and there's a gradual move, new I think in the new administration move toward greater consideration of making the Chinese currency more convertible. There's no reason why China couldn't be part of this and add to it the dollar, euro, yuan, uh, day area. And uh, this system as it is now would then look like that. It'd be 50% of the world economy by fixing two exchange rates. And one of them, the Chinese currency is already fixed. So it's just still fixing the dollar, euro rate. And you fix the problems of the system because you get, you restore the anchor, the mainstream stream of the world economy, and uh, it would go on to it. Now, I won't, uh, we could go and talk about alternatives, but that's, uh, that's really not my main message. It's to get to a new system that would give us uh, um, uh, a, a currency, a world map, a global currency. I call it the INTOR, but whatever it could be anything else, and that would be what I would do to help the system. Thank you.